Well, good evening and welcome back to the Journey Home program. I'm your host, John Mark Grodi, and once again we have this great privilege here on EWTN to bring to you a story, a conversion story. Uh, tonight we're joined by Lori Ann Mancini, former Church of Christ, agnostic and new age. There's a lot of backgrounds there that we'll, that we'll explore a little bit here in a minute. Uh, but also wanted to mention at the outset that her written story, written version of this story can be found at chnetwork.org slash story. And it's titled, I Met Him in the Adoration Chapel. I'm excited to hear <laughs> the story behind that title, Lori Ann. Thanks Thank for you, being here Thank today. You. Yeah. And, and this was uh, fortuitous. You're actually semi-local here. We're, yes. We're recording here in Ohio. Yeah, I had no idea you recorded so close to my home. <laughs> yeah, it's wonderful. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank, again, thanks for being here. Oh, Let's go back. Where, where do we want to start this, this story of yours? Where do we begin? Um, well, the, the written version starts with my family background. Yeah. So um, my parents were from, are from Martin County, Kentucky, which is Northeast Kentucky, um, coal mine area. Mm -hmm. And um, there was a whole bunch of families in the 1950s that wanted to leave the coal mines and come up to better work in Columbus, Ohio. And my um, parents were just, you know, another one of those young Part couples. Group, yeah. And um, so they settled on initially the south end of Columbus and then the west side. And then um, sometime in the 1970s, they moved out to where I grew up in Canal Winchester. It was a suburb okay. farming community at that time, a small farming village of 3,000 people, um, about, I don't know, maybe 20 miles outside of Columbus. And um, so I was raised out there. We went down home a lot. And my upbringing was um, in some ways still very Southern, um, just in terms of the, you know, the sort of hospitality, especially at church and um, way of interacting at church and, um, you know, some things like that. Um, and there were many households of relatives in um, Canal Winchester and in Columbus. So. Right. Um, when I say we were Church of Christ, I'm talking, you know, maybe 10 or 12 households right, of right. family, you know, were Church of Christ. Wow. Um, so that's, that was my upbringing. Okay. And, um, and what, how, yeah. where did it fit in your family life? You know, were, were you very devout? Where did, it was certainly part of the family culture yeah, there. I yeah. don't think my parents, I, I hope I'm not misspeaking, but I don't think they were really churchgoers much before they found the Church of Christ. I think there was an uncle, actually my dad's brother, who um, led a lot of the family into the Church of Christ. Um, so I grew up literally, you know, I think maybe I was two when they started going, maybe younger. Um, so I think I did take it to heart more, okay. um, maybe then. I don't want to, I think they were serious about their faith. Sure. I don't think they weren't. But right. I, you know, growing up in it is different from coming to it in your sure. 30s, you know, or whatever. So I did lean heavily on it, and and it, it was, um, you know, when I by the time I was twelve, my um, family situation had changed. My sisters were much older; they were twelve and ten years older, and by the time I was probably nine years older, so my parents' marriage was starting to fall apart, uh -huh. and there, um, that was kind of a slow, painful, you know, few years, and so. Um, you know, there, there ended up being a lot of chaos, several years of a lot of chaos. Mm -hmm. And during that time, I really did, um, you know, rely on my faith initially. And then as that kind of, you know, I wasn't finding a lot of comfort. I really started seeking the Lord, um, you know, more. And, um, you know, so that's that's the early background. Sure. Yeah. Well, who was God to you at that point? I mean, you, so you um, rely on your I faith. I always right? understood God the Father. I was very drawn to God the Father. Yeah. I, I really, I, I really struggled with my idea of who the Holy Spirit was. And I even, to be honest, and and it was a question I was able to formulate at some point when I was a little bit older. I had a hard time understanding who Jesus was, who the Son was to me. I mean, I understood you know, his love for us and that he died for us. But I didn't feel, I felt closest to God the Father, I will say that. And, um, but, you know, as the years went on, um, I, um, I found that I was kind of searching for him and searching for consolation and feeling like I wasn't right. finding him. And, um, and actually, at, so um, Church of Christ teaching is that you, um, 
have full immersion baptism when you are of an age to assent right. to baptism. And so that was sort of understood, unspoken canon law. They don't have written canon law, mm -hmm. but that about age 12 sure. is typically when that happened at that time. Um, I think that's a little bit different. I've seen younger baptisms since then or heard of. But um, so I was baptized by my Uncle Gene. Um, but I kind of feel that my, at the time, I felt that my motivations for that baptism were um, maybe not quite pure, you know. And so um, I kind of had some angst over that. And the next summer at church camp, I wanted to be re-baptized and try to get my mind right this time. And um, and the interesting thing that happened was I, I didn't feel that I had gotten it right that time either. Huh. And so that night... Uh, you know, it was one of those long, dark nights, you know, it was, I didn't sleep and I, I felt very um, far from God, very anxious. And I would say that that was sort of the start of a few years, many years of um, really having a dark existential angst and feeling that I had searched for God and I just couldn't find him and I didn't understand how to get close to him. Yeah. And um, just some very serious, you know, long-term anxiety that started sure. around that time. It's interesting, this this question, this language of, of whether or not a baptism takes, right, you know? Yeah, that might be my own invention. Well, I don't no. know that they teach that. But... Well, no, sure, but but it's yeah. it's certainly, it, it's a, because it's a question, uh, especially apart from the Catholic Church, what are the sacraments and what right. do they do? Right. You know, at that time, in terms of it taking, right, what did you think baptism, a, a well-taken baptism, what did you think it would uh, do from your perspective? Well, I mean, for sure, you know, we taught um, that, you know, the teaching was, you know, that you had to be baptized to receive right. saving grace from okay. our Lord. And it is scriptural, yeah. you know, for sure. Um, I guess they sort of expected, and maybe I do think some people have a, an experience, you know, when they come up out of the sure. water that they have been saved, received by Jesus. Right. Um, I think it would be fair to say the Church of Christ doesn't emphasize um, personal experiences like that. You mm -hmm. follow the rule and that should be enough. But I really didn't feel yeah. like things were okay. Sure. I really didn't. Yeah. Okay. You know? yeah, yeah, that would, yeah, some difficulty there. Yeah. Okay. So that, that started you off though into a, a new period of Yeah, difficulty. of questioning. So that kind yeah. of was the rest of my, I'm going to say high school years. Sure. And then, um, you know, I did have a lot of spiritual questions. I was a, a deep thinker. Had a lot of questions. I remember, you know, kind of stumping my Bible class teachers a lot. I would have, you know, really heavy questions, things that, you know, keep you up at night. <laughs> and they would struggle to answer and say, well, you're just a real philosoph philosophical <laughs> thinker. And well, good for you for thinking about these things. And well, I don't know, you know, but we'll just pray. And that, that was fine. You know, I'll take prayers. But yeah. um, I had a lot of questions on my plate. And so... By the time I graduated high school, I knew I wanted to go to college. I loved school. I loved studies. Um, that And that was kind of new. My family didn't, you know, they, there was some tacit support. Um, they didn't really understand. I was first generation. Um, I know at one point my mom was really hoping I'd go into the Army Reserves. <laughs> but, you know, and that's a great way to go. Um, but, you know, I didn't, that wasn't my temperament, you know, at the time. Um, so I found a Church of Christ college called David Lipscomb University in Nashville, Tennessee. And, uh, you know, age 17, I'm headed down there in a Chevy celebrity and, <laughs> um, you know, lived on campus. And I was really excited because I thought, well, I'm going to meet like-minded people with all these heavy questions about spirituality. Right. And that was not actually my experience. Hmm. Um, so, um, you know, Nashville is... And I thought, oh, it's the South, I'll have a lot in common, but Nashville is a different Southern experience from the Southern experience I was raised with. And I right. actually didn't meet a lot of kindred spirits. Um, and so actually by the second year I went, it would have, I, I did my freshman and sophomore year. By the third year, when it was almost time to get ready to go, I really, I just had this visceral sense that I could not go back. Mm. I could not go back there. And so, but I wanted to continue college studies. So I um, somehow applied for, I don't remember how this all happened, but I applied to be a student at The Ohio State University. And somehow that all went through. And I mean, it, it was late in the year. You know, it might have even been August or something. And I was able, my transcripts, I was able to get that. And this was old, you know, there was just snail mail at that time. There was no, you know, 
digital <laughs> request or anything like that. I mean, I had to literally get the actual transcripts and, you know, get them to the, the college office. But I, I was accepted and I got enrolled. And um, I did end up moving on to campus. Um, so, um, you know, that, that was the start at OSU. And then I, my first quarter there, I took a philosophy class because I thought, well, people tell me I have philosophical questions. Maybe I'll take a philosophy class. I don't know. I was going to ask too about those yeah. questions. So, I mean, and maybe you're going to answer this in a moment, but were the questions more about the more specific theology of your particular denomination or were they bigger questions about faith in general? They were both. Okay. They were both. But um, some, you know, really about the nature of eternity mm -hmm. and, you know, how would our Lord, you know, have a realm where some of us wouldn't be with him? You know, did did he make that realm? Did, you know, things like that. Right. Got it. Um, and do you have to be Church of Christ to be in that realm? Because there are a whole lot of people that aren't in the Church of Christ, like a whole lot of people. <laughs> you know, it's a pretty small denomination. Yeah. Um, so, or faith tradition. I don't think they refer to themselves as a denomination, but, um, you know, I just, I was really worried about people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it seemed like a small boat. Yeah. And, um, yeah, and then, well, that was the Sure. Yeah. Okay, so you got into that philosophy question. Yeah, class. the that, philosophy that help class. <laughs> no, it didn't. It did not help. Um, the man was wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, he, but he was not Christian, and I think he. I think those Midwestern philosophy professors. I. I don't know. I just kind of have a feeling that they want to get these Midwestern or these Bible Belt kids and really give them a workout and make sure by the end that they've asked all the hard questions and maybe their faith comes out intact, maybe it doesn't, but their job is to get you to really question. Yeah. And so I didn't really have the formation to withstand that kind of questioning, you know? Yeah. And so by the end, I, I was, I wouldn't say atheist, but I, because I did feel, you know, the love of, of my creator. I did feel that in my life. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't prepared to say that wasn't real, but I was definitely agnostic. And furthermore, I had really come around to um, a very feminist, you know, perspective, um, especially over, you know, issues of, you know, reproduction. Um, it, my understanding now is so different, it's actually even hard to talk about that, but I, it, that's where I was at the time, you sure. know, that's how I came out of that class. So I came out agnostic and, and I'm, to be perfectly honest, you know, pro-choice. Yeah. Um, you know, it, that's where I was, and and that was hard. You know, that was yeah. hard because it, I, you know, there was some more anxiety there. Um, if if you know, if I didn't have Christianity, you know, what do I have? And so, yeah. what I found instead was um, I actually started drinking a lot at that time, and I didn't realize I was self medicating, but I was. Yeah. So that whole the whole college lifestyle, you know, I really took to that. You, know, you mentioned the, the comment about the philosophy class. I chuckle because I, I studied philosophy and I've been in you know both secular as well as religious contexts studying philosophy. And what's called philosophy nowadays is often merely just skepticism, right. merely just questioning. You know, which there's some place for some questioning, but the the goal of philosophy is to is is a love of wisdom. Yeah. It's to find something true, good, and beautiful to sink your teeth into. And so, they often give you just the questions. But they're not interested in trying to give you something That's true. That's right. And, and so. the beautiful twist in my life is the man that my husband led me to. Mm -hmm. um, so we married um, in 2002 when neither one of us were Christian. Mm -hmm. But um, my husband is, he has that heart for the true and the good and the beautiful. Yeah. And I sensed that in him. And he was a philosophy major and he did advanced studies. Um, and even, he wasn't quite an ABD, you know, an all but dissertation, but almost. Um, and he left academia for a variety of reasons, but we could have these talks, right. you know, and he was actually instrumental in my even um, opening up to the Catholic Church at one point and just, you know, saying, well, be open-minded, you know, go see sure. what they have to say. You know, it was in a different context, yeah. but um, it was his openness and our ability to talk that was absolutely part of my journey. and. That's part of my faith now even is being able to talk through these things with him and he yeah. has 
philosophical training in the sense that you mean. Mm -hmm. And so I do get that in my life now yeah. through our conversations. Yeah, I think we, we, we really who grateful. ask those questions, uh, we have a real home in the Catholic Church because, yeah. I mean, we talk about that more later, but there's, it's really the place to be able to ask questions oh, fruitfully and positively. So you know? true. But, it's uh, beautiful. In terms of that time, but let's go back to that time period. So you, the difficult, the college experience, you've gotten this taste of a, a, a sort of a skeptical, maybe even a cynical sort of a I'm sense. I'm going to say even cynical. Yeah. And then, you know, that real, you know, at this time, it's even more extreme. But there was a very, you know, anti, you know, kind of a, almost a retelling of American history that mm -hmm. maybe isn't so accurate now, I realize. But, you know, really anti patriarchy, anti, you know, Western Christian tradition, the whole, you know, thing. The whole thing is, you know, out, out the window and we're mad about it. Yes. <laughs> you know, yeah. so I was, I, you know, that was the education I was receiving. So I sure. was right and stop, you know, with all of that. But I did have a little bit more of a sense of the spiritual because I truly did feel the love, you know, that was there in the universe that, that we came from. I don't know how, if I would have phrased it that way, but I had had a sense of that, that I never quite lost. Right. I did eventually. And that was a very dark time. But at, at that point, um, I didn't, I hadn't lost that, Gotcha. you know? And so that led to some other questioning, you know, there was on campus, they have lots of, you know, everything. And I, I wandered into a yoga class at some point and had some experiences there. And so, you know, that led to, you know, a couple years of serious, um, it's one particular type of yoga. And then um, it was, I'm trying to think when I went, I wound up at the Buddhist center. I'm trying to think what year that was. I think that was after my marriage. That was really many years later, okay. actually. So you did meet your husband in somewhere in this time? Period. No, he. I didn't meet okay. him until the year 2000. Gotcha. Okay. Our paths had crossed many times, but we didn't actually meet until 2000. Okay. Yeah. So that this is, but you were still in the college experience. Did you, how did, yeah. how did that? So I was in college a long time. I, yeah. I got two bachelor's degrees. Gotcha. Okay. And um, so uh, a really um, wonderful part of my college experience, I um, got my first degree in 91. And that was a degree in education. And I realized late in life that I loved the French language mm. and I picked it up easily. And so I wanted to be a French teacher. And so I got my first degree in education, but I wanted to be really fluent to be a teacher. And so I wanted to go back and get a degree in just French and really, really good fluent. Yeah. And um, I was hoping to do study abroad, but I couldn't um, do that, it wasn't feasible for me. So I found another way to go to France um, which was with Volunteers for Peace. And so I planned an eight week trip one summer um, and for almost no money, I got to go and I you know, did a little bit of community service work, but it wasn't anything too strenuous. And in exchange, I got room and board. And um, like in one case, we were camping out on a, a, rest, a kind of an architectural restoration site. This was in Southwest Central France and we were helping restore an old church and an old town hall and we slept in the town hall and we took turns preparing the meals. And um, that trip was was very um, formative in my life. I met a family that I'm still close friends with. And um, it was my first contact with the old churches, you know, the old Euro European churches. Right. And, um, you know, I think I think that really did plant a seed, a sense of Christianity goes back like a lot longer than anything <laughs> I've come into contact with here, you know, in my life. Right. Um, you know, but it was weird because most of the French people I met were not people of faith, you know, and they have, um, you know, almost a disdain, you know, for their, the people I was meeting at that time, almost a disdain for their Catholic history, mm. you know. Um, and then years later, I was able to go back um, as a um, an English teaching assistant. It was the it was a Fulbright teaching assistantship, which it's not a Fulbright, but you had to apply, and the committee, you know, picked the ones they wanted to go. And somehow, I I got to go, which is that's another almost miraculous thing because I didn't really have any support at the university just because it was so big, and I didn't know any of the professors. But yeah. somehow, that all went and. And I got to go, and um, 
that was an amazing time too. But I do, I have a very clear memory now because I have context for what happened to me now. But I remember it was um, the fall of 1994 and I went and visited um, Paris and I was in Sacré-Cœur. Mm -hmm. And there is such a powerful feeling in Sacré-Cœur, such a, I mean, almost this, you know, this palpable sense of the spiritual. And I, I didn't really understand what it was at the time. Um, and that, it just left a big impression on me, yeah. you know, and it, that led to a lot more questioning on my part, but that's as yeah. far as it went. And I was still very much not Christian and had developed very much an anti-Christian sort of bent for, for years. For those who don't know, what does Sacre Coeur mean? Oh, uh, Sacre Coeur is the um, Sacred Heart. Yeah. And if I understand correctly, it was a church that was built actually after the French Revolution, sort yeah. of in reparation for the excesses and the, I mean, it was, it was, you know, a rough time and people were killed and many priests and religious were killed. And so um, Sacre Coeur was built in reparation for that. And what I learned many years later after my conversion is that um, the tabernacle, or actually the monstrance, right, is has been on the altar showing um, our Lord in the Eucharist um, and his Eucharistic presence um, that has been shown in perpetuity since the the, the cathedral is open, or it's church beautiful. was open. I don't think uh, it's a cathedral, but since it was open. When you mentioned earlier, and again, we don't have to go into this now, we can return to it later, but you mentioned that you had a, a sense and a love of God the Father, but maybe even a, a sort of a question, an unease about um, Jesus. Of course, the, the part of the focus on the devotion of the Sacred Heart is on God becoming man and being with us had a human heart for us. So it's beautiful that you were able to have that encounter there. Yeah. yeah. I didn't know what it was at the right, time. Right, but that right. was like a to be continued in my sure, life. Sure, I, sure, I sure, could sure. go back and talk to that young woman. I would yeah. tell her, just wait. You just wait. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Guess what happened next? Yeah. So um, after that, you know, just more years of, um, you know, just being in the world. And again, there was a lot of, a lot of alcohol. That was definitely a theme. <laughs> Had to deal with that um, a few years ago, actually. Um, so I had a boyfriend at that time. Um, and uh, anyway, I got through that year, and and then I didn't really have a legal way to stay in the country. I wanted to, mm. but I wanted to, uh, to to come home. And, and I always thought I could get back to France, and it would be really easy to get a visa again. Um, it's not that easy, mm. um, but I'm just grateful for the time that I have. But I came home, that would have been... Um, 96 or 95 that I came home and so just you know I worked I became a copy editor and um, I ended up not teaching but I went into textbook publishing um, copy editing and then I eventually became a freelance writer for, for the textbook industry and um, uh, so 97 then I ended up yeah trying to think so I bought a house there's, that's, I didn't really buy a house, but it's a <laughs> little bit of a departure there. But anyway, um, so that relationship ended with my boyfriend um, in the late 90s. Um, oh, and I got to go to Austin, Texas. That was another thing. Um, I got to go to Austin, Texas for a year as a freelance writer. And then when I came back, that was when I really met my husband, uh, okay. Nick. Um, and so our first date was December 13th, 2000. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I really, I really fell in love with him. Yeah. Very, very early on. <laughs> yeah. Well, how'd you meet him? What, what were, what, what were tracking so, you guys? So, um, the short, the way we tell it is we met at band practice. So uh -huh. we were both, um, musicians and had a lot of friends in the local music scene. And I had songs that I had written and some, um, people that were, you know, playing music with me and, we needed, actually my husband's a bass player, but we needed a drummer. And so a friend of a friend asked him to come and be our drummer. Mm -hmm. um, and he, you know, that's where we met. And um, eventually he and I had our own, like we were an act and he was the lead guitarist. And uh -huh. It was just a two guitar thing. And then we were in another band together where he was a bass player and I was a singer. And I actually played trumpet on that one and a little bit of guitar. And yeah. So anyway, yeah. We're going to go to a break here in a minute. Okay. But before we do, there just you know you mentioned earlier that that meeting your husband and eventually your relationship and the, being truth seekers together is significant. But yes. maybe just bring us up to speed for a moment in terms of this point in your journey. Where, where is God? 
would you say at that point? I'm a little bit angry at okay. God because um, I there's you know the suffering in the world and you know the injustice in the world and I you know took a dim view of Christianity mm -hmm. and these were his people <laughs> so I was just generally irritated okay. you know kind of that sense of grievance right. you know that you see that's kind of where I was okay yeah well great well, we'll yeah. pick that up here in a minute okay. and hear what happens next so. okay. um, thanks for being here on the journey home program I, I wanted to uh, mention again that uh, Lori Ann's story can be found at chnetwork.org again if you if you go there we have thousands of conversion stories journey home episodes as well as written stories we actually send out a new uh, written story like Lori Ann's every month if you visit chnetwork.org slash newsletter you can sign up to receive that so again thanks for being here we'll be back in just a minute to hear the rest of Lori Ann's uh, story see you in a minute Welcome back to the Journey Home program here on the second half of the hour. We're joined tonight by Lori Ann Mancini, former Church of Christ, agnostic, and New Age. And wow, there'll be a few things in there, but uh, <laughs> the, there could, we, we could have filled up the screen with uh, all kinds of interesting aspects of your background. And, and you mentioned during the break that you're leaving out a whole lot, right? It's <laughs> not a lot. Yeah. <laughs> could only fit so much in an hour. Or so, mm -hmm. but we'll pick up where we left off. You know, you had just uh, talking about meeting your husband or your yeah. or your future husband and uh, the things you guys were involved in. So pick, pick us up from there. What, what, what happens next? Okay, so what happens next is right around the time um, I met my husband, I started working at a vegetarian restaurant. Hmm. And this was run by some very serious environmentalists. And so um, I kind of got into that scene for a while, you know, and they, um, the people who ran the restaurant, the woman in particular, had a very, um, well, first of all, very strong and kind of a, uh, I don't, she had a strong personality and she tended to like kind of lead movements. She had like that kind of thing. So they had started a nature sanctuary and they were, um, you know, getting people to come and buy property down there and donate all the property to this nature preserve and kind of live down there. And um, so the, the restaurant was kind of, you know, affiliated with that. Sure. And I ended up, I did end up um, living down on the nature sanctuary for a short time. Well, yeah, it was a short time. I worked for them for two years and she was into um, all kinds of things, you know, um, you know, kind of nature based spirituality. She had a lot of theosophy and did classes on all that stuff. And right. so I took some of her classes. And I was really excited just about how serious they were about, um, you know, preserving wilderness. And um, so I got pretty excited, went to go live down there and, you know, live in nature. And um, by that point, I was a homeowner. I had a little two-bedroom house on, on the south end of Columbus in a really terrible neighborhood. I mean, I could write books just about <laughs> that part alone. Hmm. But um, my husband saw that I was getting ready to, like, you know, sell the house and go live down there with these people. And he wasn't my husband yet. He was right, my boyfriend. Okay, sure. And he said, you know, I think, you know, we don't really know these people very well. <laughs> and maybe you might want a place to move back to. You know, I'm renting this apartment. Why don't I rent your place while you move down there? And then if you need a place to come back, you'll have it. And I thought, well... Okay, but like your your apartment's really messy. <laughs> so like, please don't make my house look like your apartment. Like that was my only rule. Um, uh, you guys are destined to be together. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I I did move down, and things did get really really weird and crazy. And he was right, as he has so often been. <laughs> He's very mild mannered, but when he does weigh in, he's like almost always right, you know, about things. Mm -hmm. He's a risk manager now, uh. and his he just can see stuff coming down the pike that not everybody else can see. He's he's great as a risk manager, as my own personal <laughs> risk manager, <laughs> as it turns out. So yeah, things got really weird down there, and I someday I will talk more about the experiences I had down there. Sure. This probably is at the time. Yeah. But I'm gonna tell you, things got really weird and, and we were really um, engaging in practices, really opening ourselves up to the spiritual realm in ways that were not safe or healthy. 
And I mean, who knew that stuff is like actually real, but it is. And, um, and, and Nick actually experienced some of that too. So I, I was in spiritual danger really at that point. And, um, you know, definitely even psychologically, this was just not like a good group for me to be spending any more time with. So kind of backed out of there, moved back to Columbus. And um, I'm trying to think at what point, at some point in there, I, I was, you know, I still had a lot of spiritual questions. And I remembered that a friend of mine from college who was um, a, a really great psychologist actually, he had been a very serious Buddhist for about 20, 25 years. And so I got in touch with him and I said, hey, where did you go when you, you, know, when you were studying Buddhism? And I, I went to the place um, that he had gone to. It was a Tibetan Buddhist center, um, specifically in case anybody, uh, it was the Karma Kagyu tradition. And I actually ended up going there for seven years. And wow. um, the interesting thing, there's so many interesting things actually, um, but the the Lama, the teacher there, was raised Catholic. Huh. And so her teaching, I realized years later, was very influenced by her Catholic formation. And I was actually learning Catholicism. <laughs> I just didn't know it, like certain teachings. Right, right. Um, for example, the teachings on redemptive suffering, mm. I first learned that as a Buddhist. Huh and how to, you know, become aware of your reactions about suffering. You know, I had spent my life up till then trying to avoid suffering or fearing suffering. And then as a Buddhist, I learned, you know, it's unavoidable, it's part of this realm. And why do you get so upset about it? Why don't you just like sit still, watch your reactions. And if you can take that suffering, and I forget what, they, you, they didn't use the term offer it up, but at least be mindful of other people who are having similar suffering right. in that moment. And so it, it I really like the mental training mm -hmm. and the spiritual training of that. Um, I learned there that you're born with this tendency to selfishness and to pride and to you know slow down your reactions, become aware, is your motivation in this moment your pride? Is it self-seeking, you know? And how can you temper that and think about the other person? Yeah, right. And how can you grow in compassion and understanding the other person? That was excellent training. Absolutely. It was beautiful training. Yeah. Um, but you're, you know, the idea I think is that you, um, you kind of do it on your own. Right. It's sort of a, it's a non-theistic, like they, there's, there's sort of some double talk about this. We say it's non-theistic. Tibetan Buddhism is not non-theistic. There's yeah. like a whole pantheon, sure. like lots of deities. And I was never comfortable with that piece. What I, I, I liked the mental training, but I did get to the point where I realized, hey, I can't do this on my own. And so um, in that tradition, they teach, well, there are certain deity practices that you can do that will help you grow. And I, I tried a couple of those. I was never comfortable. I think I had enough of my Christian upbringing that I never felt at ease with that. And I found, I found myself thinking, well, why aren't we just going to Jesus? Mm. <laughs> I did think that, you know, but I, I hadn't really worked things out with Jesus. Um, so I, that was just kind of an uncomfortable thing for me. Um, but I was, I was at the Buddhist center for seven years wow. altogether. And what finally pushed me towards the church was during this time I had become a mother. So Nick and I married in 2002 and, um, yeah, we tried to have a non-patriarchy <laughs> style wedding. It was funny. So I, you know, I wouldn't have any, um, I didn't want any Christianity at all, but we ended up, um, my mother-in-law was um, very fond of her church. And so I had a female pastor from her church do our wedding at the Y, because we wanted our money to go to the YWCA. Right. And, you know, we walked down the aisle hand in hand instead of, I wasn't, anyway, I, you know, tried to be sure. as anti-patriarchy as I could be, right? Yeah. So we had this wedding and um, that was in 2002. And then um, in 2004, I had a health crisis and I almost died. Mm -hmm. And that's probably worth talking about, but I want to <laughs> kind of go back to where sure, I, sure. I branched off. Okay. Um, so... Um, it took a, you know, I, so 2004, I almost died. And then we waited, it was a pulmonary embolism uh. that was misdiagnosed for eight weeks. And um, 
so I couldn't breathe right for a long time. And even now I still have, you know, some weirdness about that. Mm -hmm. But um, we waited to see if my breathing would get better. And eventually we realized it wasn't going to get that much better. And so, you know, we, we went ahead and um, had our first child. And so um, she was born in 2008. And um, so by the time she was five, you know, we lived in um, an urban neighborhood in Columbus, Ohio. And, um, you know, I didn't know what to do. She was going to like a private Montessori school for preschool and it was time to get her into kindergarten, start thinking about kindergarten. So I just assumed we'd go local public and everybody said that our school was the best one in, you know, the district. And so I thought, well, okay, I'll just go check it, but I'm sure I'll check the box, it'll be fine. And I went and I realized it was not gonna be a good match for her. Mm -hmm. And so here we were in the school district and I had no solution for my kid to go to school. And, um, you know, there was the, four blocks away, there was this Catholic school, but there's no way I was gonna send my kids to the Catholics. So that was just, you know, off the list. Um, so we tried to move, it didn't work out, you know, moved to a dif different district. And then um, I checked out, you know, a bunch of private schools and they weren't good matches or they were too expensive. And finally it was my agnostic husband who said, well, you know, four blocks away, <laughs> there's this Catholic <laughs> school and all these neighbors that you love send their kids there. And I started looking around and I, I did notice a difference between the kids who went there and the kids who were in our public school. And I, I do think you can do an excellent job as a Catholic family sending your kids to public school. I don't want to say that, but what I was seeing on the block, um, there were the kids that went to that school were just, they were calmer, they were keeping their innocence longer. They just, they were just such great neighbors. They took really good care of their houses, you know? And I don't know, they were just really pleasant people. And I thought, well, you know, and the school's been there a hundred years. It's been a neighborhood school for a hundred years. Like that's cool, you know? Yeah. Okay. So I, you know, I kind of pulled myself together to go check it out. And I felt like I was really walking into enemy territory because huh. I'm this non-Christian feminist and I'm going to go walk into this Catholic school and, you know, what are they going to try to teach my kids? So I went in really with a mind that I was going to grill them mm -hmm. and, you know, not like it. And I opened the door. And I'm looking at this, up on this pedestal, this, you know, probably five foot statue of Our Lady. And I just remember sunlight was pouring into the lobby and I was sort of disarmed by this palpable sense of light and love and peace. And like my armor just kind of fell <laughs> to the floor. <laughs> and I was really, I, I just, I was so, just taken aback by how I, how I felt in there. And I had a very positive experience, a great talk with the principal. And I walked out of there and I said, wow, that was really great. I still can't do it, you know? So I told my husband I wasn't mentally ready to send her there, but I liked it a whole lot better than I thought I would. And he said, well, wait one year, because she could do preschool at the Montessori school, or I mean, kindergarten at the Montessori. So one year later, I um, at his suggestion again, I took her to see the local public school and the local Catholic school. And she also didn't like the public school and loved, you know, the Catholic school, even though there was no playground, just blacktop and all that stuff. I said, you won't have a playground here. She said, I don't care. I love it. You know, wow. she was you know, super verbal and, you know, <laughs> yeah. but yeah, so she, we signed her up and, um, that was in April of 2014. And then I got really serious about studying um, Catholicism because I wanted to be sure I could answer any questions and prevent her from becoming Catholic. Right. That was my goal. And also at that time, my twins uh, were about a year old. I had had them in June of 2013. So here I am, you know, a mom of a, a six-year-old and these, you know, one-year-old twins. And I'm staying up all hours of the night reading about Catholicism, <laughs> you know, and that was, that was kind of how that summer went, you right. know, right. and I very quickly realized I was going to have to deal with some uncomfortable subjects like the Bible, which I had dismissed years ago. Um, but I also realized that Catholic sources were not going to answer the particular questions I had about biblical interpretation as a child, you know, who had been raised in the Church of Christ. Um, I would ask Catholics and they wouldn't really understand what I was asking. Um, so I found, you know, click, 
typed around online and I found a website that sadly is not up any longer, but it was called the church of Christ is Catholic.com. <laughs> and, um, I don't know. I don't know what that guy is doing now. Is Patrick Vanderpool was his name? That's right. I know he's in our list someplace. Yeah, we'll look him up after the show. Yeah, <laughs> but he was great. I don't know what he's doing now, but yeah. um, he was great. The website was so helpful, and he and I actually emailed a few times, and he prayed for me, yeah. and um, super helpful. And so I'm I'm very grateful to him. And I, you know, I, at one point I did email him and let him know I was very grateful and was entering the church a couple years later, but. Um, so I, I got my questions answered about, um, you know, um, full immersion baptism in particular, infant baptism, um, the all-male priesthood, which uh, the Church of Christ also, uh, the one I was in had all-male preachers too. But um, as a feminist, I had that question, why do we, why can it only be males? Um, and, you know, just the other, you know, Marian practices and yeah. devotions and um, purgatory, you know, all that stuff. Right. So. So you're asking all the intellectual questions. Where where was your heart in all this? And because again, it's you know you yeah my a lot heart of there. yeah a lot. I still had a lot of resistance. I was really um, I mean I was still re I was arming myself for battle. I was not going to have my child become Catholic. I was going to have her be a feminist. You know um, <laughs> you know my heart had not been won, but. Um, but there was a softening, you know, there was definitely softening. And I tell you what, I was really impressed with um, the school had the saints everywhere and, you know, be a saint, you know, live to be a saint. And I, you know, even the Buddhist part of me, you know, responded to that. Like, right. yeah, live like a saint, be a saint. And I love that they were going to teach them the virtues. You know, people weren't talking about the virtues anymore. And um, they were going to have virtue, education of virtue. I was thinking just, that was, that's yeah. what I was thinking when you were talking oh. about the Buddhist experience. That yeah. that's, Catholics would call all that training in virtue. Training in virtue. And yeah. I loved that my daughter was going to get that. And then um, I noticed that, you know, things were getting pretty weird in the public schools. You know, some weird stuff coming down the pike. Even as a feminist, I thought, hey, this is not looking good for my people. <laughs> so... Um, <laughs> You know, so I was really happy that she would get that grounding, you know, that the Catholic Church would give her. Um, you know, I didn't know it was called the natural law, but it's a little bit of natural law teaching. I thought that is looking kind of reasonable to me right now. And um, and Nick said, you know, she's going to learn the history of Western civilization. And, and I sensed that that was really important. I knew I was kind of mad about parts of it, but I sensed it was important to know it and to not just disregard, you know, casually and sure. like, have we come up with something better yet? I don't know, you know? So um, I wanted her to at least learn it. And um, so all those things were very attractive to me. So I was warming up to it. Um, I went to mass a couple times, sat in the back, you know, I was impressed with the beauty, you know, a couple things struck me as odd, had racked up a couple more questions. Yeah. Um, and I had looked online and I noticed that there was this chapel that had been open since 1998, 24 seven, run entirely by volunteers. And I knew that took a lot, like to have all those volunteers keeping that chapel open for people right. all that time. That was very moving to me. It, it was a Eucharistic adoration chapel. I didn't know what that was, but I wanted to check this chapel out sometime. And um, so actually by later, so that was all through the summer, I was kind of going to mass, um, called the church with my questions. They handed me off to Sister Ruth Hamill. She was the past, pastoral counselor, I think. Hmm. And she um, fielded a lot of my questions and she was so wonderful at it. She didn't approach me as a scholar, you know, but she just listened to everything in her prayer. I mean, I could actually feel when she was praying for me, that woman's prayers were so powerful. And I, you know, told her all my, the things I had learned as a Buddhist that I thought were really great. And she just said, well, that is all good, but who's doing all the work? Who's, how are you getting good karma? Who's doing that, you know? And are you doing that? Are you able to do that all for yourself? I thought, oh, no, no, actually, I'm not doing so well <laughs> on my own, you know? Um, and then um, it was probably, Sept it was sometime in September 2014. I was heading out for a mom's day off. Nick sent me out and um, it was a beautiful sunny day and I was supposed to turn left to get on the freeway and I felt very powerfully like I was supposed to go to adoration right then. It was a Saturday afternoon and I mean, it was like almost impossible to not drive to the chapel. I knew where it was. 
Um, so I drove there and I had learned that you're supposed to go in and genuflect on both knees. And, um, you know, I parked, I rang, I went in, I genuflected on both knees. And then I sat down, there were a few other people in there and I just started counting my breath. That's what I did as a Buddhist. I didn't have any formal prayers in my right. repertoire, I had nothing. I hadn't been talking to the Lord directly in a long time, like 25 years. So I started, I just sat, I started counting my breath and almost immediately there was a very strong sense that I was, it was actually crushing. I was supposed to be on my face on the floor, but I was too embarrassed to do that. And so I had to hold myself up on the pew and I was like holding myself up and there was this force pushing down, but it was like being crushed by love is the only way I can explain it. And there was um, a heart beating in my ears, really loud, and these words, I'm with you always, I'm with you always, I'm with you always, I'm with you always. And I'm remembering these scenes from my life, times when I thought I was lost in outer darkness, um, either some of those spiritual activities that I was talking about, or times when I was passed out drunk somewhere. And I just keep hearing this, I'm with you always, I'm with you always. And the feeling I was getting um, was a message that was a little more intricate. It was more like, I was never not with you. Uh. Even then, even then, even then. And I just sat, I could barely breathe. Um, I was weeping, you know. <laughs> and it lasted maybe a half an hour. Amen. Nothing's been the same. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Amen. So that's my story. <laughs> that's basically my story. That's, that's, that's beautiful. That's all I got, really. Um, yeah. So over time, I learned um, that the Eucharistic host um, when it has manifested as a miracle, um, is actually heart tissue. And then Sasha I remembered, Kuhn. yeah, I remembered that heart beating in my ears that day in the chapel in September 2014. And it was probably a year or two later, I remembered Sacré Coeur, which mm -hmm. means sacred heart. It's the sacred heart of our Lord. But he just flooded me flooded me with his love, with his grace. And I think all I can do is tell that story, you know, and, yeah. and some, you know, really faithful lifelong Catholics have said things to me like, I wish I could have something like that. Yeah. And what I say to them, what I think is, in my case, it was a rescue operation. Yeah. I was in real spiritual trouble and have been for a long time. And I think he just had to throw down the life raft, you know. And he just, it had to be, it had to be that way for me. But I think the grace is that people, you know, people who are lifelong faithful Catholic or, or even years long faithful Catholics, I think. They get so used to having the, the, the graces of the sacraments flow through them. They don't understand what it's like to be almost 30 years without them. And, and I think the graces that they've earned, they can't understand the faithfulness, like the graces they've earned, you know. I think that it will be more than made up for, you know what I mean? Um, our Lord, um, I mean, He's not going to let anything go unrewarded, yeah. you know, and more than more than that. And um, I, I do think it was a rescue operation in, in my case. Yeah. And also what I'm realizing now in this time in the church, he gave me this great confidence. So I don't have to get caught up in, you know, it's easy. If you're not careful online, you can get caught up into, you know, different arguments. Yeah. I would really avoid that and just stay close to our Lord, just stay close to the sacraments because what he has shown me um, or, or what the confidence he gave me in, in his Eucharistic presence, that wasn't any particular special parish. It was a regular parish. It was a regular, it was no particular kind of, you know. Sure. It was just a regular 
every day. It might have been a weekday, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. Nova Sordo, yeah. you know, whatever. Um, and I, every mass is beautiful, you know. Yeah. Every <laughs> he's there. <laughs> he's yeah. there in the mass. He's there. Yeah. He's there, and it's such a comfort to me now because I love. I go to a, a very beautiful. Um, parish now with a very beautiful mass, very reverent, and I love it. And even when I go to one that, you know, my sensibilities have changed over the years, one that isn't necessarily my preference and my sensibilities now, mm. I know he's there. Yeah. He's there. And th you just stay near him and you'll yeah. be okay. <laughs> you know? We have about five minutes left, but I wanted oh. to hearken back to something you'd said earlier that you make me think of now, which is that, that experience of being baptized, but not really knowing if it took... Right? And one of the great blessings I think we have in the sacraments, right? In the, right. Yeah, as you said, whether it's in the, you know, whether in the big basilica or the simple everyday working mass, you know, at the local parish, that in the sacraments, we, we know that God shows up Amen. and that he is doing the work, right? Amen. This, this point of certainty amidst our uncertainty, we have Jesus in the Eucharist and in Amen. the confessional. And that's, that's a priceless gift. It is. It is. And I just could not wait to receive him in the Eucharist, you know. It was really difficult waiting through the RCIA season. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I also had twin babies at home yeah. and a six-year-old. That was, you know, a tough season even for my family. Um, but I, you know, boy, that Easter vigil, you know, it was just awesome. Yeah. <laughs> And I was, um, you know, I got the full deal. I was baptized conditionally because we couldn't find the paperwork. And so, um, but yeah, just to, to have everything, you know, that night, that beautiful night, you know, confirmation, baptism, confirmation, the Eucharist, it was just awesome. awesome. And I have to say, um, as far as Nick goes, mm -hmm. he was graced with the gift of conversion. Oh, this, okay. um, this past year, he went to RCIA at St. Patrick Church. Wonderful. And he um, was received into the church this past Easter. And so Praise God. now our conversations are even, <laughs> you know, richer and and better. And we can share our faith now. And, um, oh, it's so wonderful. And it's, he's, he's, I need to get him on here. He has a yeah. lot of really great insights, yeah. great things to say. Well, we have just about three minutes left. And so one thing I, we like to do at the end here is just, you know, going back, I guess you can pick the point in your story. You could have been many different points, but someone at, at some of those tough places, you know, what's a, what is a word of encouragement you can give them if they, if they were listening right now? If you cry out to our Lord, he will be there. I mean, if you really, really cry out with your heart and um, I don't care what it is. I don't care if you're trying to get free, whatever your chains are, if it's alcohol, if it's cigarettes, if it's some other addiction, uh, you name it. I mean, if you truly cry out, he will show up for you. And I would also say, get yourself um, into a church, even if, yes, go to mass, but if you can't, if it's a weekday, go and just sit in there, but near the tabernacle, you know, put your eyes on our Lord on the cross, um, put yourself near a lady, um, say a Hail Mary, you know, ask, ask our Lord to draw near, to, to help you draw near to him. But he will always be there for you, always. Amen. Amen. Yes. You know, you mentioned uh, sometimes people listening that are Catholic, they, they sort of have this, this feeling like, I wish I could have that experience, you know. And it's funny, you, you, you had some experience of, of the faith without Christ in the sense of learning some virtue stuff with the Buddhists and all that. Yeah. You know, the, yeah. the, on the human level, trying to grow without Christ. Well, the Catholics need to realize now we've, we've been given the sacramental grace and now, now the work begins of our family, our spouse, yes. our work, sanctifying our workplace, you know, and that's, that may be where you're going to discover yes. the next point in your conversion. I'm there. I'm in the it. trenches now. <laughs> right, right. And there is, there is a, a Buddhist saying, before enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. Mm -hmm. After enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. <laughs> that's, right? That's very wise. And the, the Catholics, <laughs> it's the um, or, ora et labora. Ora et labora. And that is, that is where... We have to be in this realm, yeah. you know, but he, he's there with us. Amen. Yeah. Well, thank you Amen. so much, Lorian. Thank you, John. For your story, you. sharing your heart with us. And thank you, thank you for being here for this episode of the Journey Home program. I, I know that Lorianne's story uh, will touch so many hearts. And so thank you for being here, being part of this. 
Again, you can check out uh, her, her written story as well as many other stories like hers at chnetwork.org. And boy, we, what a good God we have. We are so loved uh, and we're so blessed here to be able to, to hear those stories. So thanks again for being here. God bless you and we'll talk to you again next week.